Protagoras Persons of the Dialogue Socrates, who is the narrator of the dialogue, to his companion Hippocrates, Alcibiades, and Critias Protagoras, Hippias, and Prodicus, Sophists Callias, a wealthy Athenian Scene, the house of Callias Companion where do you come from, Socrates? And yet I need hardly ask the question, for I know that you have been in chase of the fair Alcibiades. I saw him the day before yesterday, and he had got a beard like a man, and he is a man, as I may tell you in your ear. But I thought that he was still very charming. Socrates, what of his beard? Are you not of Homer's opinion, who says, Youth is most charming? when the beard first appears. And that is now the charm of Alcibiades. Companion. Well, and how do matters proceed? Have you been visiting him, and was he gracious to you? Socrates. Yes, I thought that he was very gracious, and especially today, for I have just come from him, and he has been helping me in an argument. But shall I tell you a strange thing? I paid no attention to him, and several times I quite forgot that he was present. Companion. What is the meaning of this? Has anything happened between you and him? For surely you cannot have discovered a fairer love than he is, certainly not in this city of Athens. Socrates. Yes, much fairer. Companion. What do you mean, a citizen or a foreigner? Socrates. A foreigner companion of what country socrates of abdera companion and is this stranger really in your opinion a fairer love than the son of cleinias socrates and is not the wiser always the fairer sweet friend companion but have you really met socrates with some wise one socrates say rather with the wisest of all living men, if you are willing to accord that title to Protagoras. Companion, what? Is Protagoras in Athens? Socrates, yes, he has been here two days. Companion, and do you just come from an interview with him? Socrates, yes, and I have heard and said many things. Companion, then, if you have no engagement, suppose that you sit down and tell me what passed, and my attendant here shall give up his place to you. Socrates, to be sure, and I shall be grateful to you for listening. Companion, thank you too for telling us. Socrates, that is, thank you twice over. Listen then. Last night, or rather very early this morning, Hippocrates, the son of Apollodorus, and the brother of Phazon, gave a tremendous thump with his staff at my door. Someone opened to him, and he came rushing in and bawled out, Socrates, are you awake or asleep? I knew his voice and said, Hippocrates, is that you? And do you bring any news? Good news, he said, nothing but good. Delightful, I said, but what is the news, and why have you come hither at this unearthly hour? He drew nearer to me and said, Protagoras is come. Yes, I replied. He came two days ago. Have you only just heard of his arrival? Yes, by the gods, he said, but not until yesterday evening. At the same time he felt for the truckle bed and sat down at my feet, and then he said, Yesterday, quite late in the evening, on my return from Oanoe, whither I had gone in pursuit of my runaway slave, Satyrus. As I meant to have told you, if some other matter had not come in the way, on my return, when we had done supper and were about to retire to rest, my brother said to me, Protagoras is come. I was going to you at once, and then I thought that the night was far spent. But the moment sleep left me after my fatigue, I got up and came hither direct. I, who knew the very courageous madness of the man, said, What is the matter? Has Protagoras robbed you of anything? He replied laughing, Yes, indeed he has, Socrates, 
of the wisdom which he keeps from me but surely i said if you give him money and make friends with him he will make you as wise as he is himself would to heaven he replied that this were the case he might take all that i have and all that my friends have if he pleased but that is why i have come to you now in order that you may speak to him on my behalf for i am young and also i have never seen nor heard him when he visited athens before i was but a child and all men praise him socrates he is reputed to be the most accomplished of speakers there is no reason why we should not go to him at once and then we shall find him at home he lodges as i hear with Callias, the son of Hipponicus. Let us start. I replied, Not yet, my good friend. The hour is too early. But let us rise and take a turn in the court, and wait about there until daybreak. When the day breaks, then we will go. For Protagoras is generally at home, and we shall be sure to find him. Never fear. Upon this we got up, and walked about in the court and i thought that i would make trial of the strength of his resolution so i examined him and put questions to him tell me hippocrates i said as you are going to protagoras and will be paying your money to him what is he to whom you are going and what will he make of you if for example you had thought of going to hippocrates of cos the asclepiad and were about to give him your money and someone had said to you you are paying money to your namesake, Hippocrates. O oh, Hippocrates, tell me, what is he that you give him money? How would you have answered? I should say, he replied, that I give money to him as a physician. And what will he make of you? A physician, he said. And if you were resolved to go to Polycletus, the Argive, or Phidias, the Athenian, and were intending to give them money, and someone had asked you, What are Polycletus and Phidias, and why do you give them this money? How would you have answered? I should have answered that they were statuaries. And what will they make of you? A statuary, of course. Well now, I said, you and I are going to Protagoras, and we are ready to pay him money on your behalf, if our own means are sufficient and we can gain him with these, we shall be only too glad. But if not, then we are to spend the money of your friends as well. Now suppose that while we are thus enthusiastically pursuing our object, someone were to say to us, Tell me, Socrates, and you, Hippocrates, what is Protagoras, and why are you going to pay him money? How should we answer? I know that Phidias is a sculptor, and that homer is a poet but what appellation is given to protagoras how is he designated they call him a sophist socrates he replied then we are going to pay our money to him in the character of a sophist certainly but suppose a person were to ask this further question and how about yourself what will protagoras make of you if you go to see him he answered with a blush upon his face for the day was just beginning to dawn so that i could see him unless this differs in some way from the former instances i suppose that he will make a sophist of me by the gods i said and are you not ashamed at having to appear before the hellenes in the character of a sophist indeed socrates to confess the truth i am but you should not assume, Hippocrates, that the instruction of Protagoras is of this nature. May you not learn of him in the same way that you learn the arts of the grammarian, or musician, or trainer, not with the view of making any of them a profession, but only as a part of education, and because a private gentleman and free man ought to know them. Just so, he said, and that, in my opinion is a far truer account of the teaching of protagoras i said i wonder whether you know what you are doing and what am i doing you are going to commit your soul 
to the care of a man whom you call a sophist and yet i hardly think that you know what a sophist is and if not then you do not even know to whom you are committing your soul and whether the thing to which you commit yourself be good or evil i certainly think that i do know he replied then tell me what do you imagine that he is i take him to be one who knows wise things he replied as his name implies and might you not i said a firmness of the painter and of the carpenter also do not they too know wise things but suppose a person were to ask us in what are the painters wise we should answer in what relates to the making of likenesses and similarly of other things and if he were further to ask what is the wisdom of the sophist and what is the manufacture over which he presides how should we answer him how should we answer him socrates what other answer could there be but that he presides over the art which makes men eloquent yes i replied that is very likely true but not enough for in the answer a further question is involved of what does the sophist make a man talk eloquently the player on the lyre may be supposed to make a man talk eloquently about that which he makes him understand that is about playing the lyre is not that true yes then about what does the sophist make him eloquent must not he make him eloquent in that which he understands yes that may be assumed and what is that which the sophist knows and makes his disciple know indeed he said i cannot tell then i proceeded to say well but are you aware of the danger which you are incurring if you were going to commit your body to someone who might do good or harm to it would you not carefully consider and ask the opinion of your friends and kindred and deliberate many days as to whether you should give him the care of your body but when the soul is in question which you hold to be of far more value than the body and upon the good or evil of which depends the well-being of your all about this you never consulted either with your father or with your brother or with any one of us who are your companions but no sooner does this foreigner appear then you instantly commit your soul to his keeping in the evening as you say you hear of him and in the morning you go to him never deliberating or taking the opinion of any one as to whether you ought to entrust yourself to him or not you have quite made up your mind that you will at all hazards be a pupil of protagoras and are prepared to expend all the property of yourself and of your friends in carrying out at any price this determination although as you admit you do not know him and have never spoken with him and you call him a sophist but are manifestly ignorant of what a sophist is and yet you are going to commit yourself to his keeping when he heard me say this he replied no other inference socrates can be drawn from your words i proceeded is not a sophist hippocrates one who deals wholesale or retail in the food of the soul to me that appears to be his nature and what socrates is the food of the soul surely i said knowledge is the food of the soul and we must take care my friend that the sophist does not deceive us when he praises what he sells like the dealers wholesale or retail who sell the food of the body for they praise indiscriminately all their goods without knowing what are really beneficial or hurtful neither do their customers know with the exception of any trainer or physician who may happen to buy of them in like manner those who carry about the wares of knowledge and make the round of the cities and sell or retail them to any customer who is in want of them praise them all alike though i should not wonder o oh my friend if many of them were really ignorant of their effect upon the soul and their customers equally ignorant unless he who buys of them happens to be a physician of the soul 
If, therefore, you have understanding of what is good and evil, you may safely buy knowledge of Protagoras or of any one. But if not, then, O oh my friend, pause, and do not hazard your dearest interests at a game of chance, for there is far greater peril in buying knowledge than in buying meat and drink, the one you purchase of the wholesale or retail dealer, and carry them away in other vessels, and before you receive them into the body as food, you may deposit them at home and call in any experienced friend who knows what is good to be eaten or drunken, and what not, and how much, and when, and then the danger of purchasing them is not so great, but you cannot buy the wares of knowledge and carry them away in another vessel. When you have paid for them, you must receive them into the soul and go your way, either greatly harmed or greatly benefited, and therefore we should deliberate and take counsel with our elders, for we are still young, too young to determine such a matter. And now let us go, as we were intending, and hear Protagoras, and when we have heard what he has to say, we may take counsel of others, for not only is Protagoras at the house of Callias, but there is Hippias of Elis, and, if I am not mistaken, Prodicus of Chios, and several other wise men. To this we agreed, and proceeded on our way until we reached the vestibule of the house and there we stopped in order to conclude a discussion which had arisen between us as we were going along, and we stood talking in the vestibule until we had finished and come to an understanding. And I think that the doorkeeper, who was a eunuch, and who was probably annoyed at the great inroad of the sophists, must have heard us talking. At any rate, when we knocked at the door, and he opened and saw us, he grumbled, they are sophists. He is not at home, and instantly gave the door a hearty bang with both his hands. Again we knocked, and he answered without opening. Did you not hear me say that he is not at home, fellows? But, my friend, I said, you need not be alarmed, for we are not sophists, and we are not come to see Callias, but we want to see Protagoras, and I must request you to announce us. At last, after a good deal of difficulty, the man was persuaded to open the door. When we entered we found Protagoras taking a walk in the cloister, and next to him, on one side, were walking Callias, the son of Hipponicus, and Perilus, the son of Pericles, who, by the mother's side, is his half-brother, and Charmides, the son of Glaucon. On the other side of him were Xanthippus, the other son of Pericles, Philippides, the son of Philomelus, also Antimoirus of Mende, who of all the disciples of Protagoras is the most famous, and intends to make sophistry his profession. A train of listeners followed him. The greater part of them appeared to be foreigners, whom Protagoras had brought with him out of the various cities visited by him in his journeys he like orpheus attracting them with his voice and they following i should mention also that there were some athenians in the company nothing delighted me more than the precision of their movements they never got into his way at all but when he and those who were with him turned back then the band of listeners parted regularly on either side he was always in front and they wheeled round and took their places behind him in perfect order. After him, as Homer says, I lifted up my eyes and saw Hippias the Elean sitting in the opposite cloister on a chair of state, and around him were seated on benches Eryximachus, the son of Acumenus, and Phaedrus, the Merinusian, and Andron, the son of Androtion, and there were strangers whom he had brought with him from his native city of Elis, and some others. They were putting to Hippias certain physical and astronomical questions, and he, ex-cathedra, 
was determining their several questions to them and discoursing of them also my eyes beheld tantalus for prodicus the chian was at athens he had been lodged in a room which in the days of hipponicus was a storehouse but as the house was full callias had cleared this out and made the room into a guest chamber now prodicus was still in bed wrapped up in sheepskins and bedclothes of which there seemed to be a great heap and there was sitting by him on the couches near pausanias of the deme of Keramias, and with pausanias was a youth quite young who was certainly remarkable for his good looks and if i am not mistaken is also of a fair and gentle nature i thought that i heard him called agathon and my suspicion is that he is the beloved of pausanias there was this youth and also there were the two adimantuses one the son of kepis and the other of leuclophides and some others i was very anxious to hear what prodicus was saying for he seems to me to be an all-wise and inspired man but i was not able to get into the inner circle and his fine deep voice made an echo in the room which rendered his words inaudible no sooner had we entered than there followed us alcibiades the beautiful as you say and i believe you and also critias the son of calistrus on entering we stopped a little in order to look about us and then walked up to protagoras and i said protagoras my friend hippocrates and i have come to see you do you wish he said to speak with me alone or in the presence of the company whichever you please i said you shall determine when you have heard the purpose of our visit and what is your purpose he said i must explain i said that my friend hippocrates is a native athenian he is the son of apollodorus and of a great and prosperous house and he is himself in natural ability quite a match for anybody of his own age i believe that he aspires to political eminence and this he thinks that conversation with you is most likely to procure for him and now you can determine whether you would wish to speak to him of your teaching alone or in the presence of the company thank you socrates for your consideration of me for certainly a stranger finding his way into great cities and persuading the flower of the youth in them to leave company of their kinsmen or any other acquaintances old or young and live with him under the idea that they will be improved by his conversation ought to be very cautious great jealousies are aroused by his proceedings and he is the subject of many enmities and conspiracies now the art of the sophist is as i believe of great antiquity but in ancient times those who practised it fearing this odium veiled and disguised themselves under various names some under that of poets as homer hesiod and simonides some of hierophants and prophets as orpheus and musaeus and some as i observe even under the names of gymnastic masters like icus of tarentum or the more recently celebrated herodicus now of Cilimbria and formerly of megara who is a first-rate sophist your own agathocles pretended to be a musician but was really an eminent sophist also pythoclides the chian and there were many others and all of them as i was saying adopted these arts as veils or disguises because they were afraid of the odium which they would incur but that is not my way for i do not believe that they effected their purpose which was to deceive the government who were not blinded by them and as to the people they have no understanding and only repeat what their rulers are pleased to tell them now to run away and to be caught in running away is the very height of folly and also greatly increases the exasperation of mankind for they regard him who runs away as a rogue in addition to any other objections which they have to him and therefore i take an entirely opposite course 
and acknowledge myself to be a sophist and instructor of mankind such an open acknowledgment appears to me to be a better sort of caution than concealment nor do i neglect other precautions and therefore i hope as i may say by the favour of heaven that no harm will come of the acknowledgment that i am a sophist and i have been now many years in the profession for all my years when added up are many there is no one here present of whom i might not be the father wherefore i should much prefer conversing with you if you want to speak with me in the presence of the company as i suspected that he would like to have a little display and glorification in the presence of prodicus and hippias and would gladly show us to them in the light of his admirers i said but why should we not summon prodicus and hippias and their friends to hear us very good he said suppose said callias that we hold a council in which you may sit and discuss this was agreed upon and great delight was felt at the prospect of hearing wise men talk we ourselves took the chairs and benches and arranged them by hippias where the other benches had been already placed meanwhile callias and alcibiades got prodicus out of bed and brought in him and his companions when we were all seated protagoras said now that the company are assembled socrates tell me about the young man of whom you were just now speaking i replied i will begin again at the same point protagoras and tell you once more the purport of my visit this is my friend hippocrates who is desirous of making your acquaintance he would like to know what will happen to him if he associates with you i have no more to say protagoras answered young man if you associate with me on the very first day you will return home a better man than you came and better on the second day than on the first and better every day than you were on the day before when i heard this i said protagoras i do not at all wonder at hearing you say this even at your age and with all your wisdom if any one were to teach you what you did not know before you would become better no doubt but please to answer in a different way i will explain how by an example let me suppose that hippocrates instead of desiring your acquaintance wished to become acquainted with the young man zeuxippus of heraclea who has lately been in athens and he had come to him as he has come to you and had heard him say as he has heard you say that every day he would grow and become better if he associated with him and then suppose that he were to ask him in what shall i become better and in what shall i grow zeuxippus would answer in painting and suppose that he went to orthagoras the theban and heard him say the same thing and asked him in what shall i become better day by day he would reply in flute playing now i want you to make the same sort of answer to this young man and to me who am asking questions on his account when you say that on the first day on which he associates with you he will return home a better man and on every day will grow in like manner in what protagoras will he be better and about what when protagoras heard me say this he replied you ask questions fairly and i like to answer a question which is fairly put if hippocrates comes to me he will not experience the sort of drudgery with which other sophists are in the habit of insulting their pupils who when they have just escaped from the arts are taken and driven back into them by these teachers and made to learn calculation and astronomy and geometry and music he gave a look at hippias as he said this but if he comes to me he will learn that which he comes to learn and this is prudence in affairs private as well as public he will learn to order his own house in the best manner and he will be able to speak and act for the best in the affairs of the state do i understand you i said and is your meaning that you teach the art of politics and that you promise to make men good citizens 
that socrates is exactly the profession which i make then i said you do indeed possess a noble art if there is no mistake about this for i will freely confess to you protagoras that i have a doubt whether this art is capable of being taught and yet i know not how to disbelieve your assertion and i ought to tell you why i am of opinion that this art cannot be taught or communicated by man to man i say that the athenians are an understanding people and indeed they are esteemed to be such by the other hellenes now i observe that when we are met together in the assembly and the matter in hand relates to building the builders are summoned as advisers when the question is one of shipbuilding then the shipwrights and the like of other arts which they think capable of being taught and learned and if some person offers to give them advice who is not supposed by them to have any skill in the art even though he be good-looking and rich and noble they will not listen to him but laugh and hoot at him until either he is clamoured down and retires of himself or if he persists he is dragged away or put out by the constables at the command of the pritanes this is their way of behaving about professors of the arts but when the question is an affair of state then everybody is free to have a say carpenter tinker cobbler sailor passenger rich and poor high and low any one who likes gets up and no one reproaches him as in the former case with not having learned and having no teacher and yet giving advice evidently because they are under the impression that this sort of knowledge cannot be taught and not only is this true of the state but of individuals the best and wisest of our citizens are unable to impart their political wisdom to others as for example pericles the father of these young men who gave them excellent instruction in all that could be learned from masters in his own department of politics neither taught them nor gave them teachers but they were allowed to wander at their own free will in a sort of hope that they would light upon virtue of their own accord or take another example there was cleinias the younger brother of our friend alcibiades of whom this very same pericles was the guardian and he being in fact under the apprehension that cleinias would be corrupted by alcibiades took him away and placed him in the house of ariphron to be educated but before six months had elapsed ariphron sent him back not knowing what to do with him and i could mention numberless other instances of persons who were good themselves and never yet made any one else good whether friend or stranger now i protagoras having these examples before me am inclined to think that virtue cannot be taught but then again when i listen to your words i waver and am disposed to think that there must be something in what you say because i know that you have great experience and learning and invention and i wish that you would if possible show me a little more clearly that virtue can be taught will you be so good that i will socrates and gladly but what would you like shall i as an elder speak to you as younger men in an apologue or myth or shall i argue out the question to this several of the company answered that he should choose for himself well then he said i think that the myth will be more interesting once upon a time there were gods only and no mortal creatures but when the time came that these also should be created the gods fashioned them out of earth and fire and various mixtures of both elements in the interior of the earth and when they were about to bring them into the light of day they ordered prometheus and epimetheus to equip them and to distribute to them severally their proper qualities epimetheus said to prometheus let me distribute and do you inspect this was agreed and epimetheus made the distribution 
there were some to whom he gave strength without swiftness well he equipped the weaker with swiftness some he armed and others he left unarmed and devised for the latter some other means of preservation making some large and having their size as a protection and others small whose nature was to fly in the air or burrow in the ground this was to be their way of escape thus did he compensate them with the view of preventing any race from becoming extinct and when he had provided against their destruction by one another he contrived also a means of protecting them against the seasons of heaven clothing them with close hair and thick skins sufficient to defend them against the winter cold and able to resist the summer heat so that they might have a natural bed of their own when they wanted to rest also he furnished them with hooves and hair and hard and callous skins under their feet then he gave them varieties of food herb of the soil to some to others fruits of trees and to others roots and to some again he gave other animals as food and some he made to have few young ones while those who were their prey were very prolific and in this manner the race was preserved thus did epimetheus who not being very wise forgot that he had distributed among the brute animals all the qualities which he had to give and when he came to man who was still unprovided he was terribly perplexed now while he was in this perplexity prometheus came to inspect the distribution and he found that the other animals were suitably furnished but that man alone was naked and shoeless and had neither bed nor arms of defence the appointed hour was approaching when man in his turn was to go forth into the light of day and prometheus not knowing how he could devise his salvation stole the mechanical arts of hephaestus and athene and fire with them they could neither have been acquired nor used without fire and gave them to man thus man had the wisdom necessary to the support of life but political wisdom he had not for that was in the keeping of zeus and the power of prometheus did not extend to entering into the citadel of heaven where zeus dwelt who moreover had terrible sentinels but he did enter by stealth into the common workshop of athene and hephaestus in which they used to practise their favourite arts and carried off hephaestus's art of working by fire and also the art of athene and gave them to man and in this way man was supplied with the means of life but prometheus is said to have been afterwards prosecuted for theft owing to the blunder of epimetheus now man having a share of the divine attributes was at first the only one of the animals who had any gods because he alone was of their kindred and he would raise altars and images of them he was not long in inventing articulate speech and names and he also constructed houses and clothes and shoes and beds and drew sustenance from the earth thus provided mankind at first lived dispersed and there were no cities but the consequence was that they were destroyed by the wild beasts for they were utterly weak in comparison of them and their art was only sufficient to provide them with the means of life and did not enable them to carry on war against the animals food they had but not as yet the art of government of which the art of war is a part after a while the desire of self-preservation gathered them into cities but when they had gathered together having no art of government the evil entreated one another and were again in process of dispersion and destruction zeus feared that the entire race would be exterminated and so he sent hermes to them bearing reverence and justice to be the ordering principles of cities and the bonds of friendship and conciliation hermes asked zeus how he should impart justice and reverence among men should he distribute them as the arts are distributed that is to say to a favored few only one skilled individual having enough of medicine or of any other art for many unskilled ones shall this be the manner in which i am to distribute justice and reverence among men 
or shall I give them to all? To all, said Zeus, I should like them all to have a share, for cities cannot exist if a few only share in the virtues as in the arts. And further, make a law by my order, that he who has no part in reverence and justice shall be put to death, for he is a plague of the state. And this is the reason, Socrates, why the Athenians and mankind in general, when the question relates to carpentering or any other mechanical art, allow but a few to share in their deliberations, and when any one else interferes, then, as you say, they object, if he be not of the favoured few, which, as I reply, is very natural. But when they meet to deliberate about political virtue, which proceeds only by way of justice and wisdom, they are patient enough of any man who speaks of them, as is also natural, because they think that every man ought to share in this sort of virtue, and that states could not exist if this were otherwise. I have explained to you, Socrates, the reason of this phenomenon. And that you may not suppose yourself to be deceived in thinking that all men regard every man as having a share of justice or honesty and of every other political virtue, let me give you a further proof, which is this. In other cases, as you are aware, if a man says that he is a good flute player or skillful in any other art in which he has no skill, people either laugh at him or are angry with him, and his relations think that he is mad, and go and admonish him. But when honesty is in question, or some other political virtue, even if they know that he is dishonest, yet, if the man comes publicly forward and tells the truth about his dishonesty, then, what in the other case was held by them to be good sense, they now deem to be madness. They say that all men ought to profess honesty, whether they are honest or not, and that a man is out of his mind who says anything else. Their notion is that a man must have some degree of honesty, and that if he has none at all, he ought not to be in the world. I have been showing that they are right in admitting every man as a counsellor about this sort of virtue as they are of opinion that every man is a partaker of it. And I will now endeavour to show further that they do not conceive this virtue to be given by nature, or to grow spontaneously, but to be a thing which may be taught, and which comes to a man by taking pains. No one would instruct, no one would rebuke, or be angry with those whose calamities they suppose to be due to nature or chance, they do not try to punish or to prevent them from being what they are, they do but pity them. Who is so foolish as to chastise or instruct the ugly, or the diminutive, or the feeble? And for this reason, because he knows that good and evil of this kind is the work of nature and of chance, whereas if a man is wanting in those good qualities which are attained by study and exercise and teaching, and has only the contrary evil qualities, other men are angry with him, and punish and reprove him. Of these evil qualities one is impiety, another injustice, and they may be described generally as the very opposite of political virtue. In such cases any man will be angry with another, and reprimand him, clearly because he thinks that by study and learning, the virtue in which the other is deficient may be acquired. If you will think, Socrates, of the nature of punishment, you will see at once that in the opinion of mankind, virtue may be acquired. No one punishes the evildoer under the notion, or for the reason, that he has done wrong. Only the unreasonable fury of a beast acts in that manner. But he who desires to inflict rational punishment does not retaliate for a past wrong which cannot be undone. He has regard to the future, and is desirous that the man who is punished, and he who sees him punished, may be deterred from doing wrong again. He punishes for the sake of prevention, thereby clearly implying that virtue is capable of being taught. This is the notion of all who retaliate upon others either privately or publicly. And the Athenians, too, 
your own citizens, like other men, punish and take vengeance on all whom they regard as evil doers, and hence we may infer them to be of the number of those who think that virtue may be acquired and taught. Thus far, Socrates, I have shown you clearly enough, if I am not mistaken, that your countrymen are right in admitting the tinker and the cobbler to advise about politics, and also that they deem virtue to be capable of being taught and acquired. There yet remains one difficulty which has been raised by you about the sons of good men. What is the reason why good men teach their sons the knowledge which is gained from teachers, and make them wise in that, but do nothing towards improving them in the virtues which distinguish themselves? And here, Socrates, I will leave the apologue and resume the argument. Please to consider, is there or is there not some one quality of which all the citizens must be partakers, if there is to be a city at all? In the answer to this question is contained the only solution of your difficulty. There is no other. For if there be any such quality, and this quality or unity is not the art of the carpenter, or the smith, or the potter, but justice and temperance and holiness and, in a word, manly virtue, if this is the quality of which all men must be partakers, and which is the very condition of their learning or doing anything else, and if he who is wanting in this, whether he be a child only or a grown-up man or woman, must be taught and punished, until by punishment he becomes better, and he who rebels against instruction and punishment is either exiled or condemned to death, under the idea that he is incurable. If what I am saying be true, good men have their sons taught other things and not this, do consider how extraordinary their conduct would appear to be, for we have shown that they think virtue capable of being taught and cultivated both in private and public, and, notwithstanding, they have their sons taught lesser matters, ignorance of which does not involve the punishment of death, but greater things, of which the ignorance may cause death and exile, to those who have no training or knowledge of them, ay, and confiscation as well as death, and in a word, may be the ruin of families. Those things, I say, they are supposed not to teach them, not to take the utmost care that they should learn. How improbable is this, Socrates! Education and admonition commence in the first years of childhood, and last to the very end of life. Mother and nurse and father and tutor are vying with one another about the improvement of the child, as soon as ever he is able to understand what is being said to him. He cannot say or do anything without their setting forth to him that this is just and that is unjust. This is honourable, that is dishonourable. This is holy, that is unholy. Do this and abstain from that. And if he obeys, well and good. If not, he is straitened by threats and blows, like a piece of bent or warped wood. At a later stage they send him to teachers, and enjoin them to see to his manners even more than to his reading and music. And the teachers do as they are desired. And when the boy has learned his letters and is beginning to understand what is written, as before he understood only what was spoken, they put into his hands the works of great poets, which he reads sitting on a bench at school. In these are contained many admonitions, and many tales and praises and encomia of ancient famous men, which he is required to learn by heart, in order that he may imitate or emulate them and desire to become like them. Then again, the teachers of the lyre take similar care that their young disciple is temperate and gets into no mischief and when they have taught him the use of the lyre, they introduce him to the poems of other excellent poets, who are the lyric poets, and these they set to music, and make their harmonies and rhythms quite familiar to the children's souls, in order that they may learn to be more gentle, and harmonious, and rhythmical, and so more fitted for speech and action. For the life of man in every part has need of harmony and rhythm, then they send them to the master of gymnastic, in order that their bodies may better minister to their virtuous mind. 
and that they may not be compelled through bodily weakness to play the coward in war or on any other occasion this is what is done by those who have the means and those who have the means are the rich their children begin to go to school soonest and leave off latest when they have done with masters the state again compels them to learn the laws and live after the pattern which they furnish and not after their own fancies and just as in learning to write the writing master first draws lines with a style for the use of the young beginner and gives him the tablet and makes him follow the lines so the city draws the laws which were the invention of good lawgivers living in the olden time these are given to the young man in order to guide him in his conduct whether he is commanding or obeying and he who transgresses them is to be corrected or in other words called to account which is a term used not only in your country but also in many others seeing that justice calls men to account now when there is all this care about virtue private and public why socrates do you still wonder and doubt whether virtue can be taught cease to wonder for the opposite would be far more surprising but why then do the sons of good fathers often turn out ill there is nothing very wonderful in this for as i have been saying the existence of a state implies that virtue is not any man's private possession if so and nothing can be truer then i will further ask you to imagine as an illustration some other pursuit or branch of knowledge which may be assumed equally to be the condition of the existence of a state suppose that there could be no state unless we were all flute players as far as each had the capacity and everybody was freely teaching everybody the art both in private and public and reproving the bad player as freely and openly as every man now teaches justice and the laws not concealing them as he would conceal the other arts but imparting them for all of us have a mutual interest in the justice and virtue of one another and this is the reason why every one is so ready to teach justice and the laws suppose i say that there were the same readiness and liberality among us in teaching one another flute playing do you imagine socrates that the sons of good flute players would be more likely to be good than the sons of bad ones i think not would not their sons grow up to be distinguished or undistinguished according to their own natural capacities as flute players and the son of a good player would often turn out to be a bad one and the son of a bad player to be a good one all flute players would be good enough in comparison of those who were ignorant and unacquainted with the art of flute playing in like manner i would have you consider that he who appears to you to be the worst of those who have been brought up in laws and humanities would appear to be a just man and a master of justice if he were to be compared with men who had no education or courts of justice or laws or any restraints upon them which compelled them to practice virtue with the savages for example whom the poet Pherocrates exhibited on the stage at the last year's Linnaean festival if you were living among men such as the man-haters in his chorus you would be only too glad to meet with eurybates and phrenondus and you would sorrowfully long to revisit the rascality of this part of the world you socrates are discontented and why because all men are teachers of virtue each one according to his ability and you say where are the teachers you might as well ask who teaches greek for of that too there will not be any teachers found or you might ask who is to teach the sons of our artisans the same art which they have learned of their fathers he and his fellow workmen have taught them to the best of their ability but who will carry them further in their arts and you would certainly have a difficulty socrates in finding a teacher of them but there would be no difficulty in finding a teacher of those who are wholly ignorant and this is true of virtue or of anything else 
if a man is better able than we are to promote virtue ever so little we must be content with the result a teacher of this sort i believe myself to be and above all other men to have the knowledge which makes a man noble and good and i give my pupils their money's worth and even more as they themselves confess and therefore i have introduced the following mode of payment when a man has been my pupil if he likes he pays my price but there is no compulsion and if he does not like he has only to go into a temple and take an oath of the value of the instructions and he pays no more than he declares to be their value such is my apologue socrates and such is the argument by which i endeavour to show that virtue may be taught and that this is the opinion of the athenians and i have also attempted to show that you are not to wonder at good fathers having bad sons or at good sons having bad fathers of which the sons of polycletus afford an example who are the companions of our friends here perilous and xanthippus but are nothing in comparison with their father and this is true of the sons of many other artists as yet i ought not to say the same of perilous and xanthippus themselves for they are young and there is still hope of them protagoras ended and in my ear so charming left his voice that i the while thought him still speaking still stood fixed to hear at length when the truth dawned upon me that he had really finished not without difficulty i began to collect myself and looking at hippocrates i said to him o son of apollodorus how deeply grateful i am to you for having brought me hither I would not have missed the speech of Protagoras for a great deal, for I used to imagine that no human care could make men good, but I know better now. Yet I have still one very small difficulty, which I am sure that Protagoras will easily explain, as he has already explained so much. If a man were to go and consult Pericles or any of our great speakers about these matters, he might perhaps hear as fine a discourse but then when one has a question to ask of any of them like books they can neither answer nor ask and if any one challenges the least particular of their speech they go ringing on in a long harangue like brazen pots which when they are struck continue to sound unless someone puts his hand upon them whereas our friend protagoras can not only make a good speech as he has already shown but when he is asked a question he can answer briefly and when he asks he will wait and hear the answer and this is a very rare gift now i protagoras want to ask of you a little question which if you will only answer i shall be quite satisfied you were saying that virtue can be taught that i will take upon your authority and there is no one to whom i am more ready to trust but i marvel at one thing about which i should like to have my mind set at rest you were speaking of zeus sending justice and reverence to men and several times while you were speaking justice and temperance and holiness and all these qualities were described by you as if together they made up virtue now i want you to tell me truly whether virtue is one whole of which justice and temperance and holiness are parts or whether all these are only the names of one and the same thing that is the doubt which still lingers in my mind there is no difficulty socrates in answering that the qualities of which you are speaking are the parts of virtue which is one and are they parts i said in the same sense in which mouth nose and eyes and ears are the parts of a face or are they like the parts of gold which differ from the whole and from one another only in being larger or smaller i should say that they differed socrates in the first way they are related to one another as the parts of a face are related to the whole face and do men have some one part and some another part of virtue or if a man has one part must he also have all the others by no means he said 
for many a man is brave and not just or just and not wise you would not deny then that courage and wisdom are also parts of virtue most undoubtedly they are he answered and wisdom is the noblest of the parts and they are all different from one another i said yes and has each of them a distinct function like the parts of the face the eye for example is not like the ear and has not the same functions and the other parts are none of them like one another either in their functions or in any other way i want to know whether the comparison holds concerning the parts of virtue do they also differ from one another in themselves and in their functions for that is clearly what the simile would imply yes socrates you are right in supposing that they differ then i said no other part of virtue is like knowledge or like justice or like courage or like temperance or like holiness no he answered well then i said suppose that you and i inquire into their natures and first you would agree with me that justice is of the nature of a thing would you not that is my opinion would it not be yours also mine also he said and suppose that some one were to ask us saying o protagoras and you socrates what about this thing which you were calling justice is it just or unjust and i were to answer just would you vote with me or against me with you he said thereupon i should answer to him who asked me that justice is of the nature of the just would not you yes he said and suppose that he went on to say well now is there also such a thing as holiness we should answer yes if i am not mistaken yes he said which you would also acknowledge to be a thing should we not say so he assented and is this a sort of thing which is of the nature of the holy or of the nature of the unholy i should be angry at his putting such a question and should say peace man nothing can be holy if holiness is not holy what would you say would you not answer in the same way certainly he said and then after this suppose that he came and asked us what were you saying just now perhaps i may not have heard you rightly but you seemed to me to be saying that the parts of virtue were not the same as one another i should reply you certainly heard that said but not as you imagine by me for i only asked the question protagoras gave the answer and suppose that he turned to you and said is this true protagoras and do you maintain that one part of virtue is unlike another and is this your position how would you answer him i could not help acknowledging the truth of what he said socrates well then protagoras we will assume this and now supposing that he proceeded to say further then holiness is not of the nature of justice nor justice of the nature of holiness but of the nature of unholiness and holiness is of the nature of the not just and therefore of the unjust and the unjust is the unholy how shall we answer him i should certainly answer him on my own behalf that justice is holy and that holiness is just and i would say in like manner on your behalf also if you would allow me that justice is either the same with holiness or very nearly the same and above all i would assert that justice is like holiness and holiness is like justice and i wish that you would tell me whether i may be permitted to give this answer on your behalf and whether you would agree with me he replied i cannot simply agree socrates to the proposition that justice is holy and that holiness is just for there appears to me to be a difference between them but what matter if you please i please and let us assume if you will i that justice is holy and that holiness is just pardon me i replied i do not want this if you wish or if you will sort of conclusion to be proven but i want you and me to be proven i mean to say 
that the conclusion will be best proven if there be no if. Well, he said, I admit that justice bears a resemblance to holiness, for there is always some point of view in which everything is like every other thing. White is in a certain way like black, and hard is like soft, and the most extreme opposites have some qualities in common. Even the parts of the face which, as we were saying before, are distinct and have different functions, are still in a certain point of view similar, and one of them is like another of them. And you may prove that they are like one another on the same principle that all things are like one another, and yet things which are like in some particular ought not to be called alike, nor things which are unlike in some particular, however slight, unlike. And do you think, I said in a tone of surprise, that justice and holiness have but a small degree of likeness? Certainly not, any more than I agree with what I understand to be your view. Well, I said, as you appear to have a difficulty about this, let us take another of the examples which you mentioned instead. Do you admit the existence of folly? I do. And is not wisdom the very opposite of folly? That is true, he said. And when men act rightly and advantageously, they seem to you to be temperate. Yes, he said. And temperance makes them temperate. Certainly. And they who do not act rightly act foolishly, and in acting thus are not temperate. I agree, he said. Then to act foolishly is the opposite of acting temperately. He assented. And foolish actions are done by folly, and temperate actions by temperance. He agreed. And that is done strongly which is done by strength, and that which is weakly done by weakness. He assented. And that which is done with swiftness is done swiftly, and that which is done with slowness, slowly. He assented again. And that which is done in the same manner is done by the same, and that which is done in an opposite manner by the opposite. He agreed. Once more I said, is there anything beautiful? Yes. To which the only opposite is the ugly. There is no other. And is there anything good? There is. To which the only opposite is the evil. There is no other. And there is the acute in sound. True. To which the only opposite is the grave. There is no other, he said, but that. Then every opposite has one opposite only and no more. He assented. Then now, I said, let us recapitulate our admissions. First of all, we admitted that everything has one opposite and not more than one. We did so. And we admitted also that what was done in opposite ways was done by opposites. Yes. And that which was done foolishly, as we further admitted, was done in the opposite way to that which was done temperately. Yes. And that which was done temperately was done by temperance. And that which was done foolishly by folly. He agreed. And that which is done in opposite ways is done by opposites. Yes. And one thing is done by temperance, and quite another thing by folly. Yes. And in opposite ways. Certainly. And therefore by opposites, then folly is the opposite of temperance. Clearly. And do you remember that folly has already been acknowledged by us to be the opposite of wisdom? He assented. And we said that everything has only one opposite. Yes. Then, Protagoras, which of the two assertions shall we renounce? One says that everything has but one opposite, the other that wisdom is distinct from temperance, and that both of them are parts of virtue, and that they are not only distinct, but dissimilar, both in themselves and in their functions, like the parts of a face. Which of these two assertions shall we renounce? For both of them together are certainly not in harmony. They do not accord or agree. For how can they be said to agree if everything is assumed to have only one opposite, and not more than one? And yet folly, which is one, has clearly the two opposites, wisdom and temperance. Is not that true, Protagoras? What else would you say? He assented. 
but with great reluctance. Then temperance and wisdom are the same, as before justice and holiness appeared to us to be nearly the same. And now, Protagoras, I said, we must finish the enquiry, and not faint. Do you think that an unjust man can be temperate in his injustice? I should be ashamed, Socrates, he said, to acknowledge this, which nevertheless many may be found to assert. And shall I argue with them or with you, I replied? I would rather, he said, that you should argue with the many first, if you will. Whichever you please, if you will only answer me and say whether you are of their opinion or not. My object is to test the validity of the argument, and yet the result may be that I who ask, and you who answer, may both be put on our trial. Protagoras at first made a show of refusing, as he said that the argument was not encouraging. At length he consented to answer.